In this lecture, we will focus on descriptive statistics. We'll start with an overview of descriptive statistics, focus on the role of measurement scales in the context of descriptive statistics, talk about types of descriptive statistics, and then finish up describing visualization when it comes to descriptive statistics. In other words, visualizing those descriptive statistics, which is another way of understanding them. So let's start with an overview of descriptive statistics. Generally speaking, we have two types of statistics we can focus on, descriptive and inferential statistics. So what's the difference? Well, descriptive statistics refer to statistics that are used to describe the sample. Now, inferential statistics also describe something, but you're actually trying to make inferences or generalizations about the underlying population based on data that you have from a sample that comes from that population. So in this lecture, we're going to focus on descriptive statistics. They're very useful for a number of different reasons, and they can also be used to inform our inferential statistics. So let's focus on descriptive statistics. OK, so descriptive statistics are used to describe the characteristics of a sample quantitatively. As I just mentioned, they're not used to generalize beyond the sample of data or to make inferences about the population from which that sample of data was acquired. Now, they're also useful for assumption testing for inferential statistics, such as assessing the extent to which a variable has a relatively normal distribution if you're using parametric inferential statistics, or the extent to which there might be certain extreme values or outliers. Using a box plot, perhaps you could identify that. So let's talk about the role of measurement scales in the context of descriptive statistics. Now, we need to know what the measurement scale is for a variable before we actually run descriptive statistics. And the reason is that the type of measurement scale will inform which type of descriptive statistic is most appropriate. Now, to review, there are four different types of measurement scales, nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio. You can think of nominal as being categorical in nature, meaning they don't have any inherent numeric properties. Rather, we can count how many people or things or cases fall within each level of that particular nominal variable. Meaning, for instance, let's count how many people have a red shirt on, a green shirt on, and a blue shirt on. No one has all three on at the same time. And so we could count up. But again, there's no inherent numeric qualities or properties here. That is, red is not higher than green, blue is not higher than, than red, and so forth. And so what this means is that we're simply talking about different levels or categories here, which is why a nominal variable or measurement scale is sometimes referred to as a categorical variable. Now, the next three imply that we have order, and these are ordinal, interval, and ratio. Ordinal is like a categorical variable, but we have assigned some type of order to the different levels within that variable. So using the example you see here, we might have small, medium, and large. So how many people are wearing a small shirt versus a medium shirt versus a large shirt? And then we might say that, well, these do have an inherent order to them, and therefore we can apply a rank order number to them, such as one, two, and three, in this case for small, medium, and large. What we don't know here is the interval or the space between the different levels. So what is the space between small and medium? And what is the space between medium and large? In other words, is it an equal space between small and medium as it is to medium and large? So we don't know the actual size of the intervals here with an ordinal measurement scale. Now with an interval and ratio measurement scale, we do know that information. And the difference between an interval and a ratio scale is that an interval is going to be continuous, and so too is going to be a ratio measurement scale is also going to be continuous. The major difference between the two, though, is a ratio measurement scale is going to have a true zero meaning that zero actually means the absence of that variable. A classic example of this is time. So if you have zero seconds, it means the absence of time passing here. And when we do have a true zero, that means that we can start making statements like 10 seconds is twice as long as five seconds. So these are the different ways that we can distinguish between these different measurement scales. Now, when it comes to identifying an appropriate type of descriptive statistic, we do need to know what that measurement scale is. And generally, we can talk about these measurement scales I just mentioned in terms of two even broader categories of categorical versus continuous. Now, nominal measurement scales are always going to fall under that categorical bucket. But sometimes we might throw ordinal under that as well. Continuous is always going to include interval and ratio measurement scales, but sometimes we might include ordinal in there. So ordinal is kind of a wild card here, and sometimes it doesn't fit as neatly into categorical or continuous by themselves, and sometimes it might fit into both buckets, and you have to decide which is going to be most appropriate given the context. So let's talk about some different types of descriptive statistics. Okay, so 
Categorical variables can be described using counts and frequencies. This is the most classic way of doing this, whereas continuous variables can be described using different indices of central tendency, such as mean, median, and mode, or indices of dispersion or variability, such as the interquartile range, or simply the range, the variance, and standard deviation. So, in terms of describing categorical variables, again, we can use counts or frequencies. For example, a categorical variable might be the facility that employees work in. And let's imagine that there's three different levels to this categorical variable. There's Portland, Sacramento, and Seattle. So the different levels correspond to the different facilities or categories. And so the unit of measure here, let's assume, is the employee. So it's how many people are working in each one of these facilities. And so you can see in this table that's presented here, we have 283 people in the Portland facility, 699 in the Sacramento facility, and 301 in the Seattle facility. So this is an example of counts, or sometimes called frequencies. We've just done a count or frequency. We just counted up the number of people that belong to each level here. Here's another example. So let's say that the categorical variable is job satisfaction. So this is actually, let's say, an ordinal measurement scale. But in this case, we're going to treat it as a categorical variable as opposed to a continuous variable. Let's assume that the job satisfaction variable or item in question is the statement, in general, I am satisfied with my job. And then survey respondents can respond with the different levels of the variable that most strongly corresponds to how they perceive this, which ranges from strongly disagree, disagree, agree, and strongly agree. So there's four different levels here, and they do have an order to them where we, most people would agree that disagree is higher than strongly agree, and agree is higher than disagree, and strongly agree is higher than agree. And the unit of measure is going to again be employees here. And so we can simply count up how many people responded with strongly agree to the statement, in general, I'm satisfied with my job. Well, we see strongly agree is 35, strongly disagree is 21, disagree is 91, agree is 97. So again, this is a way we can apply counts and frequencies when describing a categorical variable. And in this case, we've just decided that this ordinal measurement scale variable is going to be classified as a categorical variable. And thus, counts and frequencies are most appropriate here. Now let's talk about when it comes to describing continuous variables. So as I mentioned before, we can use indices of central tendency and dispersion or variability. And so indices of a central tendency include the mean, median, and mode. And if we have a normal distribution like this, the mean, median, and mode will all be equal to each other. This is if, the, if you have a 100% or completely normal distribution of the scores around for that particular variable. So it makes this, this bell shape here. The mean, the median, and the mode will all be the same. If you recall, the mean is the average of the scores, the median is the middlemost score, and the mode is the most frequently occurring score. Now, if we have any kind of skew to the distribution, or we have a non-normal distribution, in other words, this can affect how we actually interpret the, and what the values of the mean, median, and mode are going to be, and they won't be the same anymore. So right here, you see an example of a positively skewed distribution. And it's positively skewed because the tail is more on the positive end of things here. And so you, this would be illustrative of a situation in which you have a relatively low base rate occurrence if this was frequency of events occurring. So it's more likely to have zero or uh, one events occurring than many events occurring. So this would be a classic example of what that would look like. And in this case, you'll see that the mean, median, and mode are not going to be exactly the same values. And you can get an idea of how sometimes a positively skewed distribution means that you have extreme values in the right-hand tail there, the more positive tail, which could represent the fact that perhaps this is pay in an organization and CEO pay is an extreme value or executive pay that's pulling the average further away, uh, further to the right or in a more positive direction here. So in this instance, with a positively skewed distribution, the highest value is going to be the mean, then the next highest is the median, and then the mode will be the lowest here. Now, again, the question is, how much is this influenced by outliers? And this is one of the important aspects of why we would go about actually describing our data using descriptive statistics, because perhaps we don't want to include, let's say, executive pay, because those are extreme values or outliers, or maybe we do have a good reason we do want to include them for subsequent analysis. OK, so now let's take a look at what's called a negatively skewed distribution. And so here you can see that the tail is more on the, the closer to the low hand side of the distribution here. So it's on the left hand side. So in this case, we will once again see that the mean, median, and mode are not the same value because of the skew to the distribution here. 
And so in this instance, the mean is going to be the lowest value, the next lowest is the median, and the next lowest after that is the mode value. So again, you can see how these measures of central tendency might not always be in what we consider the center. And this is where sometimes people consider, particularly when it comes to using the mean or the median, which one is going to be most appropriate. And so when it comes to extreme or outlier values, the mean is going to be more susceptible to those typically because it's going to be pulled towards those outlier values and influenced by them. Now the median, however, will be less influenced by that. And so sometimes when we're talking about things like compensation or pay in an organization, we might choose to use the median if we really want to represent something closer to the middle of that distribution. Now let's talk about this idea of kurtosis. And this is essentially how fat and skinny our distribution actually is. And so let's start with a leptokurtic distribution here. And so this is a more narrow distribution here and we have really thin tails here. And so this can be contrasted though with a mesokurtic, which is a normal distribution, which is what we saw earlier. Now a platykurtic distribution is going to have fatter tails and it's going to be have less of a peak to it. And so both skewness and kurtosis are two things we want to look at to assess the extent to which a variable is normally distributed if it is a continuous variable. Now, the, interestingly, there are different indices we can use of skewness and kurtosis that a lot of statistical software packages will provide for us automatically, but really nothing beats looking at the variables visually displayed in order to determine the extent to which there is a normal distribution or lack thereof. So now let's move on to measures of dispersion and variability and away from measures of central tendency. So measures of dispersion and variability include the interquartile range or simply the range as well as the variance and the standard deviation. So the range is simply the highest score that you have for a variable minus the lowest score for that variable. And so you can either report the range as the lowest score to the highest score or the difference between those two. Now the interquartile range on the other hand is the 75th percentile value minus the 25th percentile value where the middle 50% where it represents the middle 50% of the rank order values. So in other words, it is the upper quartile minus the lower quartile. So this can be a really good way of recognizing or identifying dispersion in the data, especially when you have if you're interested in using the median as opposed to the mean and you'd like to identify the extent to which scores vary or fluctuate around or, or dispersed around that median value here. The median is going to be that 50th percentile in the interquartile range. Okay, so now let's move on to the variance, which really operates around the mean. So the variance is an indicator of the collective distance values fall around the mean. And the standard deviation is simply the standardized distance of values around the mean, and it's actually equal to the square root of the variance. And so the standard deviation is usually what we try to interpret because it is standardized. The variance, on the other hand, is not standardized, so it's not directly interpretable, but it does go into calculating the standard deviation. So let's take a look at these in greater context here by providing a normal distribution. So let's focus on a standard deviation here. So if values fall in a perfect normal distribution, 68% thereabouts of scores will fall within plus or minus one standard deviation of the mean. So a little over two thirds of the values will fall within plus or minus one standard deviation of the mean. This is why a standard deviation is useful for understanding how dispersed scores are. Now, if the standard deviation is equal to zero, it means that there is no variation around the mean. Every single person or every single case in that sample has exactly the same value. In other words, they have the mean value. Now, if we talk about two standard deviations below and above the mean, if we have a completely normal distribution, 95% of scores will fall within plus or minus two standard deviations of the mean. So virtually everybody. And if we get to three standard deviations above and below the mean, about 99.7% of those scores or cases will fall within that range, that plus or minus three standard deviations. So anybody that's outside of that range is probably going to be an outlier. So now let's talk about how we visualize descriptive statistics and the value that visualization can have for describing our data. 
So data visualizations are useful for both exploring and explaining our data. Now the most appropriate type of data visualization will depend on the measurement scale and whether you're focusing on a single variable, which we refer to as a univariate display, or multiple variables, which we refer to as a multivariate display. So for example, if we have one categorical variable, we might present, and let's say this, we're just interested in the frequencies here, we might present the data as a bar chart, where we have the frequency of, let's say, male and female employees presented here, or we might present something in the scale or in the format of a pie chart as well, which is great for presenting proportions. Now, we also, let's say we have geographic data where we have the head count for facilities in each state that our company has facilities, and here we can actually use the categorical variable as state, so here we have 48 states represented, and within that we can count up how many people work in each one of the facilities that belong to those respective states. And this is actually a heat map here where lighter scores our lighter colors actually mean that there's a higher head count. Now, if we have multiple categorical variables, we can use what's called a trellis or a lattice structure like this, where we can actually present stack bar charts. And in this case, it's Likert type item responses. So let's imagine this is a survey. People are responding anywhere from strongly disagree to strongly agree. And so we can see the proportion of people that fall, that responded to each one of these items and at what level of that response scale, which is ordinal in nature, did they respond? Now, if we have one continuous variable and we want to understand the distribution, a histogram is a great starting place. And so here we see sales data, or sales in dollars that people have generated, let's say over a quarter, and we can see the total sales for each person represented um, here, where we see that the most people are going to be in the middle of the distribution in terms of their scales. Uh, the sales that they generate, and the fewest people will be in the tails. Now this looks more or less like a normal distribution, and so a histogram is a useful way for understanding and explaining the distribution of a relatively continuous variable. Now another way we can do that is using a violin plot. So here's base pay, and we can see with the violin plot we get this symmetrical distribution, which if you just look at the top half, looks like a normal distribution. This can give you an idea of the extent to which your data are skewed, or kurtotic. Now, in addition, if we're trying to detect outliers and understand what the interquartile range is, we can use a box plot for a continuous variable. And so here you see the red circles that fall outside of the whiskers on the box plot. These represent potential outlier values or extreme scores. Now, the blue box here represents the interquartile range, where the upper side of it is the 75th percentile, the lower is the 25th percentile, and the very middle is the 50th percentile, which is the median. Now, we can also use a scatter plot too, a univariate scatter plot in this context, to visualize the spread or the dispersion of those scores for a continuous variable as well. And if we want to combine it all into a single display, we can use what David Gerbing refers to as a VBS plot or a violin box scatter plot here. And so here you see that violin plot with a box plot overlaid and then the scatter plot on top of all of that. Now, if we have two continuous variables, we can use a bivariate scatter plot. And so here we have annual sales on the x-axis and variable pay on the y-axis, and we can plot these values here using a scatter plot. We could also use, if the context is appropriate, a line graph. So here we have years, which is a relatively continuous variable, and let's say workers' compensation claims this is going to be the y-axis here. And so we can start to see how these things fluctuate over time, as well as what the linear trend or nonlinear trend might be. Now, if we have one continuous and one categorical variable, we might choose to display things in the context of a line graph, this time with a legend, where we actually use our categorical variable to distinguish between two different groups, and so we can look at their different trajectories over time. Now, if we have one continuous and two categorical variables, we might apply a trellis display to histograms. And so here you can see that we actually have two categorical variables. We have sex of employee, which is male and female, as defined here, and then we also have sales and service as the department that people work in. So we have a two by two matrix here. And then the continuous variable here is going to be the sales that people in the sample have generated. And so you can see how the distributions vary in each one of these quadrants here, depending upon whether someone is a male working in sales, a male working in service, a female working in sales, or a female working in service. Now, we can also look at displays that are good for presenting two continuous and one categorical variables. So here we have data for a training, 
and training evaluation, and this is a bar graph or a bar plot or a bar chart, however you want to call it. And in this instance, we can see that we have the average test score for the pre-test and the post-test, as well as a categorical variable, which is whether or not people are in the new training condition or the old training condition. And so we can display these in this manner. We could also display similar data using a stack bar graph like this, where we actually stack the values on top of them. Sometimes these can be a little bit tricky to read. Now, we can also display it in this case too, with a, depending on if it's appropriate or not, with a line graph. So here we have, let's assume this is a criterion validation, criterion related validation study that we're doing in a selection context. And here we have structured interview scores on the x-axis and job performance on the y-axis. But then our categorical variable, our third variable here, is going to be male versus female. And here we're interested in differential predictability. And we can display this using a line graph where red corresponds to male in this figure and blue to female. And we can see whether or not there are any differences that are apparent in terms of the extent to which the structured interview predicts job performance scores for these two different categories of people. Okay, so this wraps up the lecture on descriptive statistics. Descriptive statistics are really important in the context of HR analytics and analytics in general. They're used for describing data in our sample, but not for making inferences or generalizations about what we found in our sample to an underlying population. Rather, they're good for testing and whether or not we meet the assumptions that are necessary for doing other inferential statistics, as well as just simply to describe what's going on with our data. And they can be really useful for data cleaning as well, especially in terms of identifying extreme or outlier values or unrealistic values. Sometimes these will pop up or pop out, so to speak, when you visualize them in particular. We also talked about the role of measurement scales and why it's important to recognize what the measurement scale is for a particular variable in order to determine which type of descriptive statistic is gonna be most important. We also talked about different types of descriptive statistics that are appropriate for categorical variables versus those that are appropriate for continuous variables. And we finished up by doing a brief survey of the different ways that we can visualize descriptive statistics and combination of different variables that we might have. So this wraps up the lecture on descriptive statistics.